Hi, this is Jeffrey Nicholas, professor at Providence College, and this is a lecture on Charles Wright's Critical Education and Political Economy. What I want to do in this lecture is go over his article and specifically focus on the ideas that he's advancing in his article, uh, and in particular the model that he uses to talk about the distribution of wealth. And his concern in the article is the distribution of inequality in the world and how that distribution is a result of political choices, of structural choices that we make. And Wrights is an educator who focuses on the work of Herbert Marcuse, a 1960s radical. If you are interested in Herbert Marcuse, you can watch my video about him as well. But for now, I want to turn to uh, Wrights. And he begins uh, with this quote uh, from Marcuse. The Western world has reached a new stage of development. Now the defense of the capitalist system requires the organization of counter-revolution at home and abroad. Torture has become a normal instrument of interrogation around the world. Even liberals are not safe if they appear as too liberal. The reason to begin with this quote is the relevance of it today. We've had recent debates in the United States about the legitimacy and morality of torture in the face of challenges to the United States abroad. Uh, we've also seen various cries against so-called liberals, the Democrats, for being too liberal, for appearing too liberal. Interestingly enough, of course, in the 2016 presidential election, the primary there among the Democrats, there were challenges of to Bernie Sanders, who was the most left wing of the liberals running, uh, as being too liberal, but they did not get a lot of sway in the news or with the people listening. So those attacks were quickly put aside for other sorts of attacks. Although in the end, it, there were still issues of his ideas not being able to work. But the real focus here, of course, is on the idea that we're at a certain stage of development in capitalism and that a, a certain kind of organization is required. And the question that we have to ask is, why is this organization required? Why is there counter-revolution at home and abroad? And today, that counter-revolution we might call neoliberalism, uh, the tightening of social programs, the press down on wages. And the question that we have to look at is the role of inequality in this tightening of uh, organization. So Wright's question is, why is inequality the issue, right? He wants to understand what this inequality is. He wants to understand how it comes about. And he wants to challenge the, uh, the idea that we have about the origins of inequality. And so his argument is that inequality is a matter of structural relationships between those who own property and those who do not own property. So when we're talking about structural relationships here, we're talking about social structures in a particular society, the United States, Britain, wherever we might think about, and how those relationships are defined according to law or other conventions. And so we're looking specifically at those relationships between those who own property and those who not, do not. And what Wrights wants to do is prevent, uh, present us a model that depicts how the uh, income flows to the property and the non-property in a differential way, right? What are the returns to labor and capital from the increase in value? And these are the two basic factors of, of the production process, of course, right? It's the uh, labor and capital. And so what are the returns that flow to those? Those are the questions that we're looking at. And so if you just look at his model here, and we're going to come back to this later, but it's an interesting model because what it begins with is the, the value of production. What's the in inputs? And this is on the left-hand side of the model here. And so here we include the total cost of supplies, fuel, raw materials, electricity, tools, etc. And the end, which is on the right side, is the value of the pr production outputs. So we're looking at something going into a system and something coming out. 
And there's one value at the beginning and one value at the end. And so where do we get this value? Well, the, the, the value comes from labor. So what Wrights is defending here is the labor theory of value, that all value comes from labor. And we'll talk about why this is controversial in a second. And then he looks at how this is distributed. And so some of it is distributed to, of course, those who are doing the laboring, the laborers. Uh, and this is done through payroll, uh, through wages and salaries. And then you look at the income that's given to capital. So this is from rent, interest, dividends, profits, etc. And you see he already has the balance there uh, outlined for a particular year. And we see this over and over again in each year that we want to look at. So current wealth distributions uh, include 85% of total wealth held by the richest fifth uh, percent of the population, and then 11% 11, 11 by the second wealthiest fifth, 4% by the middle fifth, 1% by the second lowest fifth, and minus 1% by the poorest fifth of all households. So you see the distribution of wealth there. Uh, so Wright says households with the greatest wealth also receive the greatest incomes in as much as their incomes derive from their vast property holdings. So why do we have this particular distribution of wealth? Because those at the top have a lot of property and those at the bottom have no property and income is determined according to how much property you own, okay? This is not just Marxist theory, this is uh, capitalist economic theory. Uh, you can see this in Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, where he lays out the distribution of wealth uh, between the top one-tenth of one percent and uh, everyone else. And it's interesting to look at that chart and see you know, how, many, how much wealth is at that top one-tenth of one percent and what that means in relationship to the others there. But you also see this in literature. If you're familiar with Jane Austen's uh, Pride and Prejudice, you know there's a lot of discussion in there about how people earn their money in the wealthy classes, and it comes from uh, rent. So those who have wealth get more wealth, and those who have less property get less wealth, and those who have no property receive no wealth. And this is a, a, a drive in the um, storyline, or the plot for Jane Austen. So mainstream economics thinks that wealth inequality is natural, normal, and positive. Uh, it believes that this inequality leads to growth, that this inequality uh, produces innovation, and that it's a natural result of the system, and that we couldn't have a better, better system. But the implication here of that so-called natural inequality is the effects it has on our life chances. And so when we talk about life chances, what we're really talking about is the relative access that someone has to society's resources. So someone who uh, grows up in Providence and attends a particular public school and whose family owns no property is going to have less access to society's resources than someone who grows up in Barrington whose family owns pro probably multiple houses and goes to a better school, right? So what we're talking about here, just on a simple analysis, even before we get whether inequality is good or bad, is just what is our access to the resources that society has? And it turns out that the more wealth you have, the greater life chance that you have. That is, the more access you have to society's resources. And then the question becomes, is that a situation that we want to uh, upkeep, or is that a situation that we want to change? Do we want certain people to have less access simply because they are born with less wealth? So where does value come from? Well, the traditional idea shared both by John Locke and Adam Smith on one side and Marx on the other is simply that labor is the source of all wealth. There's lots of discussion about differences between Adam Smith and Marx, but where their, their difference lies is not in the idea of where value comes from, it's in their ideas of human beings. And so John Locke and Adam Smith, traditional liberals believe in an individualistic society that we're all 
cowboys that we can survive on our own, that we get no influences and we have no connections to any one except those that we choose. And so their theory is that there's this free hand of the market that sort of coordinates all of the choices that individuals make. Marx, on the other hand, believes that we have a social context that determines many of our beliefs, many of our actions, uh, that influences as well as uh, gives us opportunities from which to choose. So someone born in uh, downtown Providence is going to have a different social context than someone born in Barrington. And those eventually, maybe for individuals, are not going to um, be determinate, but for groups of people can be determinate. And so what Marx wants to do is have us to become socially, consciously aware of the social distribution of wealth. Now, mainstream economics disagrees with this, or at least denies today that labor is the uh, source of value. And so they've rejected Adam Smith and, and traditional political economy and says that labor is part of the cost and value comes from entrepreneurial skill, from technological innovation, and from risk taking. But in fact, if we look at what happens in the national income accounts of those accounts that uh, a nation uses to figure out how much wealth it has and you can click down there at the bottom it says see here uh, if you look at those accounts you see that they actually believe that labor is not a cost labor is the source of value and so you they look at uh, the value of inputs the value of expenditures and the sum of those values uh, added at each level of production to figure out what the actual wealth is. So even though mainstream economists deny that value comes from labor, uh, the national and the actual groundwork that's done by governments is that national uh, that income is derived, what value is derived from labor. So that takes us back to our figure here. Uh, value is added through labor in the production process. You take a piece of land and you work on it and from that land, you get a bushel of corn that you sell. And part of the uh, income from that corn goes to the laborer in terms of wages and salaries. And part of it goes to the capital. And what we see is that uh, capital receives much more of that income than does the actual labor where the, uh, the wealth, the value actually comes from. So Wright says that I emphasize that incomes returned to capital and labor are structurally determined. That is, they are conditioned primarily by societal rather than individual factors. So it's not the individual factors and individual choices that lead to this distribution. It's not the contract between the laborer and the capitalist. It's the way that those contracts are structured and enforced by society. The implication here then is that the workforce uh, is a resource uh, and is the creative actual force in the economy, not uh, simple someone sitting in a room coming up with an idea. Uh, we also see that private ownership of capital is clearly not socially necessary for value. So we can have the same sorts of values without private ownership of capital uh, and the labor because the labor is what produces the value, right? And Marx's point then is that only the labor force as a social body has a legitimate right to manage the surplus, right? So he's denying that it's the capitalist that has that right and says that it's the labor force that has the right to say, where do we put this uh, wealth that we've created? How do we divide that up? So Wright wants to end with some new goals, which I'll go over relatively quickly. Uh, a revolutionary goal of envisaging, envisaging a more encompassing view of human flourishing. How do we see people flourish from the wages and salaries that they do? And this might involve voluntary public work so that no one goes without work uh, as a resource for the commonwealth. And we also see that racism, patriarchy, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination and disrespect prevent our revolutionary goals. And so those are part of the aspects that we have to overcome in society to get the uh, equal distribution that rights is defending. The challenges here, uh, you can read these over on your own. Where does the value really come from? And again, the point of this article and this lecture is that value 
comes from labor.